Welcome to the first podcast we're recording after lockdown has been lifted. A couple of those we have already created compare some modern day topics with life in Henry VIII's time. For instance, the ethnic diversity of the crew and a Tudor pandemic. Yes, they had one too. So continuing that theme, recently the Royal Navy has launched two new magnificent vessels, the Queen Elizabeth and the Prince of Wales, sister ships to each other. Well, when Henry came to the throne in 1509, one of his first acts was to commission the building of two new sister ships, the Peter Pomegranate and, yes, of course, you've guessed it, the Mary Rose. But why did he build two new ships? In 1509, he was a young and ambitious king, but why did he feel the need to build modern fighting ships? What did Henry hope to achieve? And why, in 1545, does the French king, Francis I, decide he would send his fleet to invade England, a fleet, by the way, considerably larger than the more famous Spanish armada that would attack England some 43 years later? Well, to find out the answer to these and other questions that set the ship, the Mary Rose, in its historical context, we're going to be talking to Professor Susanna Lipscomb. Susanna is the author of five books about the 16th century, including 1536, the year that changed Henry VIII, and The King is Dead, the last will and testament of Henry VIII. She has presented numerous history series on TV, including her latest, Walking Tudor England, which you can catch up with on My5, and she's the host of Not Just the Tudors podcast from History Hit. Most importantly for our purposes, though, she's just become a trustee of the Mary Rose, so there can be no better person to be talking to. And I can see on my computer screen that she's waiting very patiently for us to start. So let's get going and say hello to Susanna. Hi, Susanna. Great to see you. Hi, Adrian. Thank you for having me on. No, fantastic. So the first thing I suppose we need to do to set this historical context and the run up to the Battle of the Solent where the Mary Rose sadly sank is to go back to the start of Henry VIII's reign or maybe even earlier than that. I mean, Henry VII had stabilised England with the end of the War of the Roses. We've also seen an end to the Hundred Years' War with France. So why is Henry, Henry VIII, so ambitious? Why is he flexing his muscles and building these two new ships? Well, I suppose it's important to remember that when he comes to the throne, he's just 18 years old, or just about to turn 18. And he has been kept under wraps for the previous years because his father had already lost one son and didn't want to lose another. And so he's desperate to uh, flex those muscles. Um, And one of the ways that he wants to make a mark, perhaps unsurprisingly for a sort of uh, man in his late teens, early 20s as the years go on, is to do so by warfare. He wants to um, gain a prestigious, glorious position in European history, much like Henry V had done and had captured... Um, large swathes of France and, you know, been the victor of Agincourt. And so Henry sees himself as a new Henry V, and that's what he's going to do. And so building ships uh, like the Mary Rose and the Peter Pomegranate is all part of that strategy. OK, so his hero Henry V, as you say, won significant battles, not least of all Agincourt, of course. So that's one thing that provokes his actions. And of course, we shouldn't really ignore what's going on in Scotland either, should we? With the king there, James IV, also building a ship called the Margaret, named after Henry VIII's sister Margaret. So maybe there's some influence there as well? Yes, so Henry's sister had gone off to marry the king of Scotland. But, you know, England and Scotland are very much not the same country at this point in time. And throughout this period, we see them often fighting and... Henry uh, has some hostility towards Scotland, despite the fact that uh, the king there is married to his sister. Um, And again, the sense of ambition from the Scots in terms of wanting to invade England and vice versa. So there's just a general sense when one looks at the European politics of this period that there's a lot of land grabbing going on, whether that's France trying to invade Italy or the Holy Roman Emperor um, 
trying to invade parts of France or the Ottomans trying to capture Vienna. I mean, it, there's, it, this is generally a sort of free-for-all period where everybody's trying to establish themselves, get as much power and territory as possible. Sure. So two years after he came to the throne, 1511, he decided to invade France, didn't he? There was a, a battle against the French. Yes, the sort of decision made in 1511, there's a, a sort of start at it in 1512. The kind of really important moment is in June 1513, when with an army of 40,000 and joined by Maximilian, who's the Holy Roman Emperor at the time, Henry VIII defeats the French at Guinegate, which is known as the Battle of the Spurs, and captures two little towns, Tournay and Terroanne, um, and there's an amazing picture at Hampton Court which shows these towns in the background and shows Henry in the foreground in the thick of battle wearing this glorious sort of black and gold armour. It's a complete fantasy because he wasn't actually allowed by his privy council uh, and his you know, his close advisers to fight because he didn't have an heir and it was too dangerous if he died. But... This picture sort of commemorates him as the great victor. In fact, actually, there's another picture hanging quite close to it, which shows a meeting between Maximilian and Henry, and they are portrayed as being equals. But the the crucial thing we have to grasp here is that they weren't. (laughs) Henry VIII is the king of a pretty puny little country Mm. lying on the outskirts of Europe. And when it comes to the great powers of Europe, France and Spain the Holy Roman Empire and Spain and the Holy Roman Empire are conjoined under the rulership of Charles V um, for 1516, 1519 onwards, then, you know, England doesn't really feature that much on their agenda. And what we see with Henry VIII and particularly with Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, uh, his right-hand man from 1514, 1515, is an attempt to muscle in on that action and put England at the centre of things when she wouldn't really naturally have been so. Right, so it's, it's a yeah, personal ambition as much as anything. It very much is. Personal ambition and, and sort of, you know, political glory. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and, of course, talking of which, there was then, uh, I think at, mostly at the behest of Wolsey, wasn't it, we, we see the field of cloth of gold in 1520, uh, where the two kings of France and England come together uh, to presumably prove themselves against each other. But what were they doing at the Field of the Cloth of Gold? That's right. So the Field of Cloth of Gold was designed to commemorate a peace uh, treaty that had been drawn up a couple of years earlier in 1518 in London, the Treaty of Universal Peace. And this was, in theory, peace between the three monarchs. Um, and... Tournay is restored to France and then there is this great celebration of the peace at a little town called Guen near Calais. So it's technically on English soil in northern France because since um, the 1340s England has held Calais. So the idea is that François Premier, Francis I, as we'll call him from here onwards, the King of France and Henry VIII will meet and they will celebrate peace ostentatiously with tournaments, with feasting. So there's great, huge amounts of food devoured at this place. There's, you know, jousting, there's feats of arms, um, tournées, and mass is held, and this sort of thing. So it's this great sort of celebration. And again, talking about pictures, there's an amazing picture. There's one at Hampton Court and one at Leeds Castle, which show the Field of Cloth of Gold. It's a later imagining. It was painted in the 1540s, but it shows... Henry and Francis meeting, particularly shows Henry, and um, it shows the sort of 6,000 English troops arriving and the temporary palace of brick and glass um, and canvas that was thrown up for Henry VIII to live in. And it's called the Field of Cloth of Gold because everyone else, the French king included, was staying in tents made of cloth of gold, which is a fabric that's made from spirals of gold through which the silk is threaded. So the silk can be any colour you like. You can have purple cloth Mm -hmm. of gold. And it's, you know, immensely expensive. Obviously, I mean, it's literally made of gold and uh, obviously looks incredible and kind of glittering in the sun. And so anyway, there's this party basically for three weeks um, on English soil in northern France where everyone has a lot to eat, a lot to drink, 
competes and it's sort of a moment to show off. And the point of all of it is that by showing that they can throw this much money at temporary display, this much money in celebrating peace, they are actually demonstrating their capacity to go to war again. Right. So it's, again, a a flexing of both sets of muscles in, in a way. Absolutely. And even as Henry leaves uh, and returns home he meets Charles V now in theory this is still sort of all under the treaty of universal peace but within a few years England and France are at war again and part of that is because in 1522 Henry Mm. has agreed with Charles V now Holy Roman Emperor to mount the great enterprise against France so in terms of a lasting peace agreement it certainly isn't that it's very much as you say this flexing of the muscles yeah And also a reflection of the very flexible way that alliances were viewed at that time, I guess. It's extraordinary. If one looks at the sort of timeline of these decades, it's, you know, uh, England and uh, the Holy Roman Empire. No, now Holy Roman Empire and France. Now France and, you know, it it just, they flip and flop back and forth. It's sort of continually changing pattern of who's in alliance with whom at any one point. And then, of course... In 1533, Henry marries Anne Boleyn, uh, which is the the start of another fraught period, ending up with the excommunication of England by the Pope, which presumably also has some influence on European politics, not just on Henry VIII. Yes, and actually, the thing I always find interesting is that even to get to that point, uh, we've seen European politics playing out in English affairs, The reason Henry VIII can't have an annulment from Catherine of Aragon, which was not an unusual thing for a pope to do, is because in May 1527, imperial troops, the troops of the Holy Roman Empire, have sacked Rome, and the pope, who's Clement VII by this point in time, has been taken prisoner in his castle of St. Angelo, taken prisoner by Catherine of Aragon's nephew, Charles V. So when, in December 1527, Henry's men arrive and ask for an annulment... There's no way the Pope can grant it without annoying Charles V. And so, and so immediately the whole thing is overladen with these political, sort of dynastic and diplomatic complications. So as you say, we, we fast forward to 1533. Henry has gone through this series of acts of Parliament which are breaking England away from Rome repudiates Catherine of Aragon, marries Anne Boleyn and is excommunicated by the Pope. And the consequences of that will be that in subsequent years, there's a moment at which the Pope issues a papal ball which says that anyone can invade England and take the English throne. This is in 1538. Now, in the intervening years, 1533, 1538, there's been a moment where Henry hasn't had to worry too much because the French and um, so Francis I and Charles V argued again. France had occupied Savoy and Piedmont in Italy and negotiated an alliance with the Ottoman Emperor, Suleiman the Magnificent, and Charles challenges Francis to a duel and leads an army into France. But when they make peace, when they become firm friends in 1538, Mm -hmm. and they have a meeting at the, the beautiful little walled city Aigues in the south of France, and they run into each other's arms and embrace. <laughs> at that point in time, Henry needs to worry, because now the Pope has said, yeah, absolutely, totally legitimate for anyone to take the throne of England, and Charles and Francis are friends. And that is when we start to see Henry investing in fortifications mm-hmm. along the south coast, uh, because the threat is suddenly real. So... The situation is that the Pope has said, OK, you can all invade England. But why is that? Is that because of the reaction against uh, the fact that Henry has sort of renounced Catholicism then? Is, is that what it is? It's a free-for-all against England because they have said, we're not Catholic anymore. Yes, although Henry would never have said that about himself. He was just not Roman Catholic in his mind. But certainly it's true that from... A religious point of view, from the Pope's point of view, by making this decision to repudiate Catherine of Aragon, by being given, you know, X amount of time to change his mind, being excommunicated, and then finally this papal ball being issued, Henry has 
cut himself off from the community of the faithful. He is, um, a, you know, a heretic, a, an infidel. He is, his lands are therefore subject to invasion by holy forces. Yes. That's the theory anyway, and that's certainly probably what the Pope has got in mind. But the Pope himself is a political player at this point in time. And as we've seen, Francis I thought nothing about allying with an Islamic power against his Catholic enemy. Yeah. So it's just a sort of quite a convenient guise as well, I think, for political machinations. Sure. So uh, what I suppose I'm trying to get at is what is the motive force behind Francis I, King of France, deciding in 1545 that he would actually invade England? Uh, is it a, a reaction against Henry's attempts to invade France? Is it the Catholic situation, a combination of all? How do you see that? Right. Well, absolutely, it's a reaction. So, talking about alliances shifting, 1542, Charles V has allied with Henry VIII to attack France and Scotland. And so the English have uh, once again defeated the Scots. So back in 1513, actually, whilst Henry was fighting in France and Catherine of Aragon was regent general, um, the Scots were defeated at the Battle of Flodden Field and the king, was James IV, died in battle. Mm. 1542, the English fight the Scots at Solway Moss and as a result of that, James V dies and his heir is Mary, Queen of Scots. He's, it's a few days old at the time and uh, she flees to France. And so what happens next is that in 1544, the English invade France and they besiege Boulogne from the 19th of July. The English Navy blockades the port and the army bombards the town. The castle is blown up on the 11th of September and then the town of Boulogne surrenders a few days later and Henry VIII rides in glorious splendour. You know, he's become this great king. So it's sort of no wonder that a year later the French forces invade the Isle of Wight and we have the Battle mm. of the Solent in which the Merry Rose goes down. Yes, of course. And of course, actually, what we should remember is in, in that uh, first invasion of France in 1522-odd and in that second war in 1543, Mary Rose was involved in a, all that activity, wasn't it? Yes. And indeed taking Henry to the Field of the Cloth of Gold, I think. Yes, so exactly. We, we, would, have, we would have seen her um, operating in 1513 um, when Henry invaded France. Field of Cloth of Gold, 1520. There's another invasion of France by the English in 1523. So she is there at every stage in this great diplomatic game uh, and involved in the action. Indeed. And, of course, that action then did come to a head in the Battle of the Solent in 1545, which is sadly when she sank. But the, the fleet that Francis I sent across the Channel at that time was absolutely huge. As I said, it, larger than the, the famous Spanish Armada. How did he get hold of such a large navy, such a large fleet? I don't really know the answer to this. It's an interesting, really interesting question. I mean, I think that basically what we have is a, a very wealthy nation. Mm -hmm. And we're in a situation where, faced with all these threats... Um, Francis I obviously invested in his navy. Although I do wonder, actually, if one part of it... I don't know if this is true or not. This is just a speculation. I mentioned that Francis had reached a alliance with the Ottomans. And we know that in the winter of 1543-44, the Ottoman fleet wintered at Toulon. I don't know if any of them were involved in the invasion of the Isle of Wight and the battle against the, uh, the English in the Solent. But certainly, France is a wealthy country, mm -hmm. uh, much wealthier than England. And so perhaps it's not that surprising that they are able to generate the revenue necessary to build a, a large fleet. Uh, and also, the, I think there is some speculation, isn't there, that there were mercenary ships as well? Which seems highly likely. I mean, the mercenaries were on board, well, they're involved in on the English side. Mm -hmm. So we can imagine every battle that's going on around Europe at this time that there are mercenaries involved and mercenary ships too. Yeah, absolutely. So then we have the, the Battle of the Solent against this huge fleet. Talk, talk us through that a little bit, Susanna. Yes, yeah, so we've got a fleet of 324 ships sailing into the Solent from on the French side, having taken the Isle of Wight. More ships than the Spanish Armada. It's the greatest foreign threat of Henry VIII's reign. <laughs> and 
the thing about the Mary Rose sinking is that we don't yet quite know why it happened. I say yet because I'm still hopeful that <laughs> there will be more that we can bring up from the bed or the, the investigations that can be done. Yeah. So the French claimed it was the result of their cannon, basically. But other suggestions are that it, that she had been refitted in 1536 and was therefore heavier than her original tonnage, um, and that was she was overmanned. Though I I I know that there is some resistance to that idea as well. Um, but that possibly might have decreased her stability and manoeuvrability. She certainly was turning stern on to face. Uh, her guns, her large guns that get towards the galleys Um, or perhaps she was trying to steer out of their way of the shot but she was manoeuvring and at some point in that moment perhaps with that great weight over balancing her, water came in through her open gun ports and this capsized her and of course as everybody listening to this will know, it's a great tragedy that there are 500 men on board, there are anti-boarding nets. People are wearing chainmail jerkins. Only thirty men are rescued. Yes, I mean, I think somebody put it. It was a, a naval disaster, but a human tragedy. Absolutely, and then of course, and then a historic triumph. I mean, in terms of for, for, as for for historians, uh, f- for each of us who's interested in ordinary life in the Tudor period their tragedy was our gain because we now know about Tudor life, everyday Tudor life, in a way that we would not know if the Mary Rose had not been found. If she had not sank, <laughs> we would not know so much that we know about everyday life in that period and, and indeed about the Navy. But at the time, of course, no one had any idea that it would be some sort of great uh, legacy to, to posterity and instead... It's his tragedy. And the king, Henry VIII himself, watched from South Sea Common as she went down. Must have Mm. been quite a moment. Yes, uh, very telling in his reign. Of course, the the other question that springs to mind after that is, so here's this huge French fleet, and we talk about the loss of the Mary Rose. There may have been loss of other English ships too. Why did the invasion cease? What, What stopped Francis carrying through? Well, I guess that he didn't succeed. I mean, uh, Portsmouth is pretty defensible. Um, If the English ships were preventing access to that narrow space through which a a ship would have to manoeuvre in order to enter the harbour, then there's not much that can be done. So it... The, the interesting thing is the Mary Rose sank whilst England was being successfully defended by the English fleet against the French. Yeah, so uh, that's the answer then. It's a successful defence of against the French. That's right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fascinating stuff. And as you say, the, the outcome, of course, is the thousands of objects that tell us so much about Tudor life. Uh, on display in the museum, many of them, obviously. Um, and and indeed, you mentioned Hampton Court a couple of times. Of course, they, they take knowledge from the Mary Rose team, don't they, to uh, tell Tudor history in Hampton Court and other establishments around the country do too. Absolutely. I mean, the wonderful thing about the Mary Rose is that it is this capture of ordinary life in a way that nothing else is because of the silt at the bottom of the Solent that preserved things that otherwise would not be preserved. Fabrics, leather, wood, things that just perish over the centuries. And that's what ordinary people could afford. We, Mm. you know, we might have, we don't actually have the crown jewels from Henry VIII's period, but I was going to say we might have something of great value like that surviving. Um, but things that ordinary people handled, much like probably the plates that you and I have in our house, you know, when they break, they'll get thrown away. They are used until they wear out. You know, you get rid of pe- just thrown out a pair of slippers that have got me through lockdown, but now have holes in them. You know, they're, they're not going to be the sort of thing one preserves for posterity, but they are the stuff of ordinary life. And on the Mary Rose, there was the stuff of ordinary life. But the yes. other thing I should say about the battle also is that uh, one his naval historian described it um, as the fact that Henry VIII sort of constructed the wooden walls around England, that the ships of Henry VIII's fleet became 
wooden walls. Up until this point in time, the channel had not been an obstacle, it had been a bridge. And instead, the construction of this fleet allows England to defend itself, well, frankly, for centuries against invasion attempts. So it's a very important moment in Mm. English history. Well, I suppose the argument could go that the building... Uh, in well, the launch in 1511 of the Peter Pomegranate and the Mary Rose is is the start of the build up of of the British fleet of the Royal Navy because Henry only inherited five ships, wasn't it, from Henry the Seventh? Yes, between five and seven. There seems to be some doubt on the exact number, and there and leaves uh, almost sixty ships out of a a navy of 106 that have served during his reign. So, I mean, he is absolutely, Henry VIII is absolutely the undisputed father of the Royal Navy. I think that sums it up nicely. Is there anything else you want to add about the politics of the day? No, I mean, this is absolutely fascinating, this period in terms of thinking about politics. And I suppose it just reminds us that whilst we see the Mary Rose as she is in terms of a unique artefact, that she was one of many ships at the time and she was part of this much greater European game of politics and that we can't really understand why she sank and we can't really understand Henry VIII's reign unless we realise that it's part of this much more intricate game that's going on between Henry and his frankly, far more important, rivals Francis I and Charles V, and indeed even the Ottoman Emperor Suleiman the Magnificent, and that we don't operate (laughs) as an island, although, interestingly, the fleet that's built up in Henry VIII's reign is something that continues to help us become more like an island. Yes, indeed. Well, on that note, I I think we've probably covered all we need to cover, haven't we? So uh, thanks very much for joining us, Susanna. It's been an absolutely fascinating chat. You're welcome. No doubt. I look forward to seeing you at the museum in your role as trustee at some period. I'll see you soon, Adrian. Thank you very much. Okay. thanks a lot. Well, we hope you've enjoyed listening to some of the history that is so much part of the story of the Mary Rose and the Battle of the Solent. Spoiler alert, we're aiming to make the Battle of the Solent itself the focus of the next in this series, looking at the action in more detail leading up to her sinking and what happens afterwards, so look out for that. In the meantime, please come and pay us a visit. During lockdown, we have taken the opportunity to update our visitor offer. One of the new features in the museum is an exciting introductory experience where Henry VIII himself explains a little bit about the history of the Mary Rose and her tragic sinking, and the experience immerses you in what it might have felt like to be on board at that dramatic moment in time when she sank beneath the waves. So, come and visit. It's a real joy to be fully open again, although we are, of course, still taking all necessary precautions to make sure you feel comfortable and safe when you visit. You can pre-book and buy your tickets from the website, where you can also make a donation. Thank you for listening and we look forward to welcoming you to the museum.